someone outside of the company that's not even associated with the company but has access to that software could launder money or steal money or just delete money from corporations and switch financial records all around without anyone, any investigator, any auditor being able to audit that. Those things I thought were interesting, but when the SEC, after I told them, bought the software with the back door in it and was started to use it for itself, then I knew that the SEC was not there to regulate like I thought it was. They were also, hey, we can find a benefit from this back door in the software. We can delete files now. Now we're above the law. And so essentially the people who were perpetrating the scam also had control or at least controlling influence over the supposed investigatory organizations and agencies. And that's what I thought the American people needed to find out through Lowell Bergman because the traditional press, the, the newspapers we went to, wanted nothing to do with this because it conflicted with their advertisers. So I was hoping that since Bergman did such a good job and was featured in this Hollywood film and had helped this other whistleblower, that you know it would be appropriate for him to at least investigate the story and if there was something to it. But he didn't come back and say, there's nothing to your story. He said, there's so much to your story that we can't publish it. Regarding what you witnessed and what you realized, what specifically posed a threat to the integrity of the U.S. economy? The fact that that back door is in the software allows any number of companies across America, which, you know, there are tens of thousands of companies that were mandated to have this type of software. Now that they have this regulatory software where if you don't have it, you'll be audited, you know, and you'll, you'll get slapped on a wrist or worse. And if you do have the software, now you're exposed to this gigantic fraud, which the operators of a company may or may not be participating or aware in. And so there's the potential for setting up patsy companies, for controlling your competition, for all sorts of diabolical financial malfeasance, essentially. And it gave them like a, a curtain. And even the auditors and the accountants can't see behind this curtain because of this new software, which further obscures the fraud from any investigator's ability to see into it because they're not familiar enough with the software. When did these events take place and what was your experience which led you to believe that there was a clear and present danger to the economy? This happened in the summer of 2003 and extended till January of 2004 when I was terminated, but I first became aware in July of 2003, I was in a meeting with one of my clients, which was Tyco International, which was one of these companies that was exposed in this accounting fraud. And at the time that I was at my client at, at Tyco, they were under investigation and under mandate by the FBI and the SEC not to delete any data. And their problem was data was building up all over the place, especially in their email. So I went in there with this Sarbanes-Oxley product to say, what happened happened because you didn't have our product. And now that you're under these mandates, these are good. We can help you clean this all up. In fact, our product can help you save disk space. And it was at that point that the person with whom we were meeting, Valley Baudasano, who is the chief general counsel of Tyco International and her team, Valley says to myself and my technical team that she's not interested in keeping this data. She wants to know how to delete this data. And she wants to know how to delete this data beyond the scrutiny of FBI and SEC. I know nothing about this, so I'm thinking this is really out of context, to which point one of the technical guys on my team says, hey, I know what you're talking about that, and we can talk about that offline or whatever, and they let me finish my presentation because I'd only worked there a couple weeks, but that stuck in my head. So a few weeks later, in August of 2003, I was at a client called the NASD, which has later changed its name, so it's now called the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, and the NASD was looking at our product and, and they wanted to use it internally. And one of the guys across the table says to me, hey, wait a minute, this product has a back door because right here where you're supposed to take this information and put it on the write once, read many storage, which is a type of permanent storage, he said there's this jar file and you can delete the jar file and then there's no evidence of that transaction whatsoever. So he was showing me across the table that there's a loophole, there's a back door in the software that allows nefarious transactions that go on and subsequently they didn't buy the software they're like this is bullshit this isn't worth the money this is this is not what it's supposed to be and you should do something about that now i had management from my side in the meeting and so i went to my managers afterwards and i'm like what's this all about and why wh what's going on with this and i was told not to talk about it can you tell me what type of evidence you had and what you actually provided to lowell bergman what i sent to bergman were emails voice recordings of executives admitting and asking me to violate uh, various r rules, regulations, laws, what have you, asking me to falsify financial statements that were later used in uh, July of 2003's acquisition of Legato, which is the company I worked for, by EMC Corporation, which is the company I ended up working for after the merger. 
How did your software relate to the Sarbanes-Oxley regulations, implemented in 2002 to prevent companies like Tyco and Enron from manipulating their records and violating the public trust? All right, so people are understanding that there are companies like WorldCom and Tyco and Enron that were betraying the public trust. They were doing accounting fraud and basically they were taking debts from their companies and then creating shell companies and giving the debt over here. So on the Tyco books or on the Enron books, it looked like they had all this money and all this profit and they were hiding their losses in a, in a separate entity. Sarbanes-Oxley came in and said the software that has to be used by the parent corporation, let's say Tyco International, uh, now has to be such that you cannot delete email messages for a certain amount of time. So certain types of documents now have what's called a life cycle, and there came all these pieces of software to handle data life cycle management. How long do corporations need to keep different pieces of data? And Sarbanes-Oxley said, well, regarding financial transactions, here's how you have to keep data, here's how you have to preserve email, and you have to preserve the, the data in a specific way. You would take the data and transfer it to what's called a write once, read many type of storage, which is a permanent type of drive storage that once you put data on there, you can read it, but you can't delete it. And if you delete it, there's all these serial numbers and you can tell that someone deleted it. So it prevents them from going around and shredding proverbial documents in the electronic world and allows oversight to take place by investigative authorities or audit auditing uh, committees. So let me get this clear. You discovered that the software you were selling to financial services companies in New York City, which was required by Sarbanes-Oxley, a law designed to prevent fraud, in reality being used to perpetuate an even deeper fraud, and that the software was used to further obscure the fraud from the public view? Well, exactly, and it's like a protection racket. So financial services companies after 2002, because of Sarbanes-Oxley, now had to buy a certain type of software that did certain things to preserve data, and that was part of the law. So they're by law required to get this software, and if you don't get it, the FBI and the SEC will come in and audit you, and you'll get all these penalties and fines, and your stock will go down. So it's like a big scare tactic. So companies are, they use fear to get companies to buy into this, but then once the companies actually buy that regulatory Sarbanes-Oxley software that we're selling, they're exposed by way of a back door where anybody who understands the software where can come in and and loot their company and the investors the operators the uh, everyone who's involved with it may or may not be privy to that and so it gets into this whole not even a gray area it gets into this whole shadow world where actions can be taken but there's no way to hold people accountable or to raise levels of accountability and awareness and, and see what went on it simply goes into this proverbial black hole so that's the danger what specifically is the vulnerability in the Sarbanes-Oxley regulatory compliance software that you were tasked to sell, and how does it work technically? All right, so the vulnerability is during the transit of data to the write once, read many file, that there's a staging area for the data where it's collected in what's called a jar file. And somebody can go in and delete that jar file, making it look like the data never, it never got to the storage, and so it's not checked in with the serial number, and it's gone from here, and no one, so it creates this black hole or a back door, or it's a, it's a point of vulnerability that's specifically located such that it can be exploited uh, to the nth degree before anyone figures out where's the money going and where's the leak. The boat will have already sank. I read in your court transcripts that both the SEC and FBI had arrested a Northrop Grumman executive and an executive from your company, Legato, for something called side contracts. Could you explain how that ties into another one of your clients, DynCorp, as well? Uh, September of 2003, I read an SEC press release, if you will, that cited one of my clients from Logicon, which is a subsidiary of Northrop Grumman, which is a client, and DynCor and being indicted and people being arrested. Now, my misunderstanding at the time was that the SEC arrested people. And I found out in my court case that it's actually the FBI who arrest people for the SEC. So I was, I had misunderstood it to that extent, who was the arresting agency. But the point from my concern was, I'm working with knowingly fraudulent software. I'm reporting it up through my management and the company. It seems like everyone's okay with this. And at the same time, clients of mine are being hit for, you know, and arrested for these side contracts. And at that time, I'd become aware that it, through this press release that my clients, both both sides, DynCorp and Northrop Grumman, were, in, were engaging in what they call these side agreements, these side deals, which on paper for accounting standards, they make it look one way, but then they cut this other set of deals. And this is really how the deal works. And it's off the radar and it's not auditable. 